Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of ARM Template Masterclass. This week we're going to put together some of the things we've learned over the last four weeks and do a more complicated deployment. We're going to look at deploying a virtual machine. Now, a virtual machine isn't just something you can deploy on its own. And this is what makes this template a bit more complex. We need to deploy a load of other resources to work alongside the virtual machine. So our template is going to be the first time we deploy more than one thing and when we have all those things work together. So these are the parts we need to deploy to actually get a virtual machine out there. And that's what we're going to have a look at deploying today. So we're not just deploying a virtual machine in isolation, we're deploying all the things it needs to actually run. So going down this list, the first thing we need is a storage account. Now, you don't technically have to have a storage account with VMs anymore, but if you want to enable boot diagnostics, which is always a good thing to do, then you need a storage account to associate with that. So we'll be deploying a storage account. You already know how to do that. We've done that in the last few videos. We're going to deploy a public IP because I want to be able to reach this virtual machine from the outside world. We're going to set up a network security group to lock down access to this virtual machine to only the ports I want. We need a virtual network for the virtual machine to run inside of, and we're going to deploy that alongside it. If you were deploying lots of virtual machines or you were deploying to an existing virtual network, you might have already pre-created this, but in our template we're going to deploy the network as well. Then the virtual machine's networking is actually a separate object. There is a network interface object, and this is separate to the virtual machine itself. And that's where we configure all the IP addressing and so on for the virtual machine. And then finally, we've got the virtual machine itself, which is going to rely on all of these things we've deployed previously to be able to work. So I wanted to call out just a few of the new concepts we're going to learn about today. Alongside just making a more complex template, there are some new things we haven't looked at before. So first up is dependencies. As we're deploying lots and lots of different resources, we're going to get to a point where some resources depend on other resources. The network interface we're going to deploy for the VM needs to be attached to a virtual network. So we need to make sure that the virtual network is deployed before the network interface. And similarly, the network interface needs to be deployed before the virtual machine, and so on. And so dependencies give us a way to define which resources de depend on other resources. So we'll have a look at how we define that within a template. There are a couple of new functions we're going to look at. We looked at functions in episode 4, so if you're not familiar with those, please go have a look. Um, but we, there's a couple of new ones here we haven't looked at before. The first is resource ID, which is, helps us obtain a full resource ID for a resource that we need. And then secondly, reference, which allows us to obtain the, the full actual object of the resource rather than just a name or a reference. And you'll see why that's useful when we get to the template. Finally, we're going to have a look at outputs. We looked at them briefly last week when we were testing functions. But this time we're actually going to use them to give us useful information about the deployment that we might need once we finish the deployment. That's enough theory now. Let's jump into VS Code and start looking at how we can create this deployment template. Okay, so we've got our ARM skeleton created here. I just used a snippet to create the empty one. And we're going to go ahead and use the snippet to populate this with our VM resources. So if we type arm dash VM and then Windows is the one we want. We're going to do a Windows VM today. And hit enter. And you'll see that deploys a whole load of resources. Now, don't be scared off by that. There are a number of different things here, but they are only the things we talked about previously, and they're pretty easy to understand once we have a look through them. You'll also see that the snippet has put in a load of placeholder names for things. These all hard code the names and so on into the resources themselves. We're going to make a few changes to those to pull them out into parameters and variables, but we'll do that in a minute once we've had a look at the resources. The first one on the list should be fairly familiar. This is a storage account. And there's really nothing different here from what we've done previously. We're just defining a name and a SKU type. Next, we've got the public IP address. So this defines the object that's going to get assigned the public IP for the VM. And this is very similar to the storage account. We've got to give it a name. And then we've got some properties. And for the and for the public IP, the two properties we're interested in here are the allocation methods. That'll be whether it's a static or a dynamic public IP. If you if you set it to dynamic, then each time you deallocate the VM, you'll get and reallocate it, you'll get a new IP address. Then the other one is the DNS setting and the sub property domain label. So that's how we can give a name to the IP address that we can use as part of a URL that Microsoft generate for us. Next is a network security group. 
So network security groups are effectively a firewall we can apply on our virtual network that allow traffic in and out, but only on the ports that we allow. And so in this resource, you can see in the properties section, we've actually got a sort of sub object. So there is an array of security rules. Security rules are the rules that actually define which ports you open or close on the NSG. And so we're adding just the one rule here, which allows inbound traffic on port 3389, so we can actually RDP to the VM. Now to keep it simple here, we're allowing inbound access from any IP to RDP to the machine. I strongly recommend you don't do this for anything that's important. Um, it's fine for us because we're just testing this, we're gonna throw it away when we're done. But you will find if you leave a public RDP port open to the internet, you will very quickly see it attacked. So you might wanna look at changing the, the source address prefix section to be your IP range from home or work or wherever you're doing this from. Next, we've got the virtual network. And this is the first time we're seeing the use of dependencies. So for the virtual network, you'll see when we create a subnet further down that it's going to use the network security group. So the network security group needs to exist before the virtual network. And so we're gonna add a dependency. So we've got this depends on section. And here we effectively list all the resources that this resource depends on. And when we do that, the ARM fabric will ensure that when we run the template, it will run those resources first and make sure they exist before it runs our resource. And so actually the order you put them in the template doesn't really matter. It's the dependencies you build up that are going to affect how they're created. So in the depends on section, you can see in its array and effectively you're just passing in the full resource IDs of the resources you need to depend on. And so this is where we make use of our second new feature, the resource ID function. The resource ID function allows you to pass in the type of resource, so in this case, it's Microsoft Network slash Network Security Groups. That's the type, and then the name of the resource in our template. And what this does is it transforms that into the actual full resource ID, which is the you know the subscription forward slash resource groups forward slash type forward slash name and so on. This arrangement here we've got here assumes that the resource is in the same subscription and resource group. If it was in a different subscription or resource group, then you can add some further parameters to the resource ID function, pass those in, and they'll get put into the output of the function. So it's just an easy way to create those long resource ID strings without having to manually create those. The rest of the virtual network is fairly straightforward. We've got some properties. Um, we set in the address prefix, so the actual IP range of the virtual network. And then we've got some sub-objects of subnets, an array of those, so we can define what subnets exist within our virtual network. And you'll see inside that subnet, we're actually using the network security group. So the subnet object has a network security group property. And in that, it expects to be provided with the ID of the network security group it's going to use. So again, we're using the resource ID function to get that, and we're passing that in. So now, that subnet has that network security group assigned to it. Next, we're going to create the network interface that's going to be attached to our virtual machine. Got some more dependencies here. This is depending on both the virtual network because it needs to be attached to the virtual network and the public IP address because the public IP address is going to be attached to this network interface. In our property section, we've got another array of sub properties for the IP configuration. So this is how we define how we set up the IP addressing on the network interface. So just like the public IP, we've got a private IP allocation, so whether it's dynamic or static, and then we're assigning the public IP address, again using the resource ID, and the subnet. And you can see on the subnet resource ID function, we're actually passing in three things. We're passing in the type, the virtual network the subnet is in, because it's a sub-property of the virtual network, and the actual subnet name. And then finally, we get into deploying our virtual machine itself. And this is a bigger resource because it's got a lot more options than the others. We've got some more dependencies because it's going to depend on the storage account for the boot diagnostics and the network interface obviously for its network access. And then in our properties section, we've got lots of options we can set around what the virtual machine is configured like. So for example, we're passing in the size, so what size of VM we want to use, we're passing in some profile information, which is the computer name and the admin username and password, passing in an image reference. So this is an object that defines which image should be used to create this virtual machine whether this pointing to a Microsoft gallery image or a marketplace image, but how, you know, where do we get the operating system for this virtual machine from? Next, we pass in some information about the disks we want. 
So we're passing an OS disk, which defines the configuration for the, for the OS disk. And if we wanted to, we could pass in any data disks here as well. In the network profile, we're attaching the network interface that we created before. And then the diagnostics profile, we're turning on boot diagnostics. And here we're using the second new function that I mentioned, which is reference. So in the storage URI, what it's expecting to receive is the URL of the blob endpoint that it can use to store the data. And so this is a property of the storage account itself. And so what reference allows us to do is go and fetch the whole storage account object so that we can then use its properties. So we're using reference coupled with resource ID because reference expects to receive a whole resource ID. And that returns the full storage account reference, which we can then look at the primary endpoint property of that and get the blob endpoint from it. And so it allows us to use all the properties of the object. In its current form, this template will probably deploy OK. But you can see a lot of the names and properties in here are hard coded, which is going to be a pain if we want to actually deploy this multiple times with multiple different machines and different configurations and so on. So we're going to look at to amend this template to add in some parameterization to make it easier to redeploy this with different settings. To save you watching me type, I've gone ahead and amended the template with some parameters and variables. Let's have a look at how that works. So first up, I've created five different parameters that are going to help us make this more generic. So the first one is what we saw previously, which is prefix. The prefix allows us to pass in a string, which is going to be used as part of the naming convention for all our resources. So if we change the prefix, we'll get a whole new set of resources with different names. Next, we're going to pass in the VM size, so you can decide at the time you create the template how big or small you want the virtual machine to be. And we're passing in the Windows OS version. So if you want to use a different operator system version, you can do so, but we've restricted that to this allowed values list so that it will only pass in Windows operating system because that's what we configured the VM to use. Lastly, we've got the admin username and admin password, so you can pass those in at runtime. You'll note that the admin password we're setting up as a secure string, so it's being passed in in a more secure manner than just a plain old string. We've only got one variable, and this is more of a ease of use factor. So for the naming conventions, we're obviously going to be using that prefix I mentioned to determine the name. For most things, it's just going to be concatenating the prefix and a indicator of what type of resource we've got. But for the storage account name, we're going to do what we did last week, and we're going to use the unique string function to make sure that we get a unique storage account name across the whole of Azure. As you saw, that's a fairly long bit of text to actually create that resource, and we're going to have to reference it a couple of times in the template. So what I've done is I've stuck that in a variable so that in the rest of the template, we can just reference that using the variable name. And you can see that in the actual storage account section here, where the name and the display name tag have been set to use that variable. For the rest of the resources, we've mainly just gone through and updated the name and display name tag to use that parameter that we passed in. So we're sticking together, we're using concatenate to stick together the parameter and then a suffix that indicates the resource type. So we've done that for public IP, the uh, network security group, the virtual network, and so on. The more significant changes come to when we get to the virtual machine section where we've used a few more of those parameters. So again, we've changed the name. You will notice in here as well in the dependency section, this is the same for the depends on in all of the template, is that we've updated the depends on resource ID sections to use those variables and parameters as well. So you have to be consistent across that. The dependency name you're using has to match the resource name. So we've updated those to use the parameters. We've done that in all the other resources that have dependencies as well. In the VM size section, we've updated that to have the VM size parameter, so we can set that up. We've put in the admin username and password parameters, and we passed in the Windows OS version. Finally, down the bottom, where we're actually referencing the resources we want to attach, like the network interface and the storage account, we're again using the parameters. So anywhere a name is referenced in a dependency, in an attachment, we need to make sure we update all of those. Finally, we've updated the output section to add some outputs that are going to be useful to us when we actually run the template. So the two outputs we've got are the DNS name of the public IP so that we can actually connect to that uh, using IDP or so on to actually access the VM, and the private IP of the VM, so the IP inside the virtual network, in case we want to use that. The output objects are pretty simple. You just create an, an object with a name of the name of the output you want to create, 
a type, which can be the usual types of string, integer objects, and so on, and then a value, which is the value you actually want to pass out. Here we're using the reference function again to go and get the whole object that we're interested in, either the public IP or the network interface object, and then grabbing the properties from that object. For the private IP, you can see it's a little bit more complicated because the IP configurations property of that network interface is actually an array of IP configurations. So you can have more than one IP configuration on a network card. We know for this one we're deploying, we're only creating one configuration. So I've hard coded in the array syntax to get position zero, the first object, and then we're grabbing the IP private address property from that. We've also created a template parameters file where we're passing in the parameter values that we want to use. This can obviously be updated each time you run it if you want to use different names and so on. You'll notice that for the admin password, it is in here in a plain text string. This is done here for just the ease of use so we can run it easily, but I wouldn't recommend you do this in production. If you're going to pass in passwords and so on, you're going to want to either pull them from something like Key Vault, or you're going to want to put them in at the command line at the time you run the template and keep them secure and not committed into your version control or anything like that. We're over in the terminal now and we're going to actually deploy this. So we're going to do exactly the same as we did in the previous weeks. Use the new Azure resource group deployment command, pass in the name, the resource group and the template and parameter files we want to use. And we'll go ahead and run that. Now this will take a while, so VM creation is, is not the fastest thing in the world. It's actually got quite a lot quicker of late, but it's still going to take a good few minutes for that to go ahead and create the resources. So you'll have to be patient. Once the resource is created, you'll get the results back, and you can see in here we've got our output section, which contains those two outputs we were interested in. The DNS name of the virtual machine, so we can actually connect to that using RDP, and the private IP address of the machine inside our virtual network. If we hop over to the Azure portal, we'll have a look, and we can see it's created all those resources we talked about. You'll also notice that there's a resource there that we didn't mention. So there is a managed disk created here. Now this wasn't something we explicitly defined in the template as a separate object, but when we created the OS disk property in the VM, that went ahead and created it as a managed disk. If we have a look at the VM itself, we can see from the properties it's got a public IP address, so it's got that public IP object associated with it. We have a look at networking, and you can see that it's attached to the network interface we'd expect. And if we have a look at the boot diagnostic configuration, we can see that boot diagnostics is working, which means it's attached okay to that storage account for us. So now we've got a complete template that will deploy a virtual machine and all its requirements from scratch. So there you have it, your very first complex template deployment, where you've gone from zero to having a virtual machine deployed. Hopefully you were able to follow along. The complete templates for this are all available on the GitHub repo, so if you want to have a look at those and try them out yourself, feel free. Next week, we're going to have a look at a pretty new feature of the ARM platform, but something I think is going to be really useful for when you're building and testing your templates and wanting to figure out what's going to happen when you deploy it, and that's the ARM what if command. So join us next week for that, and until then, have a great rest of your day and rest of your week. I'll see you next time.